Well, just before the election, I decided I had a good idea. I approached my editor and proposed writing a novel about a CIA director who is forced to resign after it is discovered that he was having an affair with his biographer who sends threatening emails to another woman in Florida who receives 20,000 emails from our top general in Afghanistan and then the Florida woman turns over the threatening emails to an FBI agent who launches an investigation and, and for good measure, sends pictures of himself shirtless to the Florida woman. And that's just chapter one. Well, I submit this to my editor, and my editor says, nah, this is way too far-fetched. Well, like the national security soap opera that is currently uh, unfolding, uh, the idea of bipartisanship seems equally far-fetched these days, I think. But this afternoon, we're going to try to make the idea of bipartisanship more plausible. And we're going to start with Hank Meyer, who no needs no introduction to this audience. He's the biographer of one of the great exemplars of bipartisanship in American history, Senator Arthur Vandenberg. And I've asked Hank to give us some highlights of the Grand Rapidian's life. Hank Meyer, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Gleaves, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'll talk more about bipartisanship at the panel. So my, my role today right now is just to talk a little bit about who Arthur Vandenberg was. And one of the things he was was the uncle of the first director of the CIA, General Hoyt Vandenberg, who came here to live with Arthur when he was a very young man and needed an appointment to West Point and Arthur was an influential newspaper editor whose newspaper was owned by Senator William Alden Smith and that helped Hoyt Vandenberg go to West Point, rose in the Army Air Corps and became the first director of the CIA. Um, we don't know anything scandalous about Hoyt, although he was a very handsome, dapper character said to be one of the most glamorous figures in Washington. Um, Arthur Vandenberg was born blocks away across the river from where we are right now, born and died about eight blocks away. He graduated from Central High School in 1900, which was the same year that he won an oratorical contest of the YMCA for his speech on the International Peace Conference at The Hague in 1899. So it's it's not too silly to say that foreign policy was a lifelong passion of Arthur Vandenberg. He was editor of the Grand Rapids Herald from the age of 22 until he went to the Senate at the age of 44 in 1928. When he arrived at the Senate, foreign policy had taken a back seat. America had turned inward in the decade after World War I, and soon after that came the crash on Wall Street and the Great Depression and the great challenges that faced the United States were domestic. At the same time, Vandenberg became a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and he and his wife Hazel were um, sought after guests along Embassy Row in Washington. And the, he, there's a lot of stories about that, but in 1934, he was at the Argentine embassy, and the Argentine ambassador's wife, who later became a good friend, um, described her first encounter with Arthur Vandenberg. She said, the American senator drank a little more than he could conveniently manage. Uh, <laughs> she described his emergence from the embassy library, pale and unsteady after brandy and cigars. He stumbled over the Aubusson carpet, knocked against a slender French chair, and managed to right himself in order to walk out in proper senatorial dignity. <laughs> now, Arthur Vandenberg was nothing if not dignified, even as the ambassador's wife mused to herself, why is it the American man has never been able to drink? Or is it that he has never learned to drink? Well, Vandenberg had a lot to learn. His odyssey was really just beginning. But he'd already learned a few things in Washington. He learned how to outflank Franklin Roosevelt. Just the year before, he had succeeded in creating the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Now, this is regarded by many people, and we have some very distinguished scholars in this room who can readily correct me, but it may have been the most effective New Deal financial reform. It may have saved the nation's banks. And Roosevelt had initially resisted it. Vandenberg 
fought for that. That was actually a bipartisan action since um, Roosevelt's vice president was in support of the bill, even though Roosevelt wasn't. But Vandenberg spent much of those first years in the Senate learning how to oppose through legislative engineering, through coalition, through some pretty pithy rhetoric and some just plain doggedness. He was fighting the boondoggles and extravagances as he saw them of the New Deal and of its grand expansion of the sway of the federal government. He also opposed, when he got the chance, any compromise of American independence in foreign policy. He pounced on any hint of a treaty or an alliance, any foreign entanglement. Well, within five years, 1939, the ambassador's wife would write, make another note in the margin of her diary alongside that earlier entry. And she said, how this particular senator has changed. He has become little by little a man of the world. Never since that embassy episode had she seen him tipsy again. Not only that, he is, at the moment, the leading aspirant for the Republican nomination in 1940. She wrote that late in 1939, just after the outbreak of World War II, when, as the leader of the Senate's isolationist bloc, Vandenberg plotted an unsuccessful fight against repeal of a key provision of the Neutrality Act that was designed to keep the United States out of war. In opposition, he gained notoriety, he gained stature, but he sacrificed electability. And Wendell Wilkie swept to the nomination instead. And I'm thinking about Wilkie as perhaps one of the most bipartisan figures in modern presidential politics. But Vandenberg kept changing. Five years later, as World War II neared its end, he gave a speech heard round the world, as it was called, when he proposed a post-war treaty among the victorious allies. And this was a speech that Roosevelt brought along with him at Yalta at the conference. There's no record of him having employed it, but it was a statement of American intentions and, in a sense, a challenge to the Russians as they were pushing the Red Army, as the Red Army was pushing across Eastern Europe. This was also the beginning of Vandenberg's really late-blooming fame. He had reversed field. He was proposing the very foreign entanglements that George Washington had been so wary of. And as an isolationist, he suddenly found himself Washington's darling and a world statesman. One after another came his appointment as delegate to the United Nations Organizing Conference in San Francisco, his role in post-war peace talks, his success in steering through Congress the Marshall Plan and NATO, and when Harry Truman succeeded Franklin Roosevelt, Truman was in trouble without him. In the ensuing years, a long-awaited peace turned into Cold War. The Soviet Union and its satellites ranged behind the infamous Iron Curtain, which was a coinage neither he nor Churchill originally came up with, but which he tried to employ in a speech before Churchill did. Uh, unfortunately, he gave that speech on the same day that, that Eisenhower returned to the U.S. as the victorious general, and that dominated the news, and Vandenberg's Iron Curtain speech was largely forgotten. John Foster Dulles wrote him a note, said, great speech, too bad nobody paid any attention. <laughs> the Kremlin also saw Vandenberg as a sinister influence on Truman. As he represented American imperialism and was sort of the devil on Truman's shoulder in their view. But he was also the voice of many American people who were groping for answers at the end of the war. He was trusted by colleagues and Truman as president and no small portion of the press. And he'd come by a sort of gravitas that uh, led some people at the time when Truman had newly succeeded Roosevelt as the steadiest leader on the international scene that we had. In fact, a young Democratic senator named William Fulbright had the temerity to suggest that the untested President Truman, thrust into office with so little preparation, appoint Arthur Vandenberg as his Secretary of State and then resign. And in the absence of a Vice President, Vandenberg would succeed him. Truman, as many of you which he dismissed as coming from Senator Halfbright. <laughs> Within five more years, Vandenberg was back in Grand Rapids. He didn't want to let on, or he didn't want to know. In November of 1950, he lay in his sick for his young family back in 1907, soon after he'd become the editor of the Herald. 
There he received a letter from Edward R. Murrow outlining plans for an hour-long CBS radio documentary. The subject was the war of nerves between the West and the shadow of the atomic bomb. And this, it was the story that Murrow wrote of the Cold War and the fight for peace in the actual recorded voices of the key figures of these past five years, 1945 to 1950. The network wanted a bipartisan story. Vandenberg, Murrow said, was the central pivot of the entire era. Murrow would use the senator's speeches and interviews to create a sort of running narration to this drama. Now, he knew Van was sick, and he didn't presume to ask him to read the lines himself. Instead, he said, we intend, with your permission, of course, to ask the distinguished actor Spencer Tracy to play the role of Arthur Vandenberg. The other voices, Truman, Churchill, Atchison, Marshall, Burns, Dulles, Vyshinsky, Bevan, Masaryk, Baruch, Gromyko, these were household names then, and we've forgotten so many of them, would come from recordings. Murrow envisioned a primetime broadcast without commercial interruption. Recordings would be furnished to schools and colleges. And this is CBS, and this is quite a change from the election campaign in 1936, at which time Vandenberg was one of Roosevelt's great antagonists when Murrow's boss, William F. Paley, pulled the plug after Vandenberg brought a tape recorder into the studio and tried to stage a radio debate with the, ra with the recorded campaign promises of Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, uh, Murrow said that all the resources of the network, from Arthur Godfrey to Jack Benny, would promote the show. Naturally, we will not undertake this project without your assent, Murrow wrote. We have turned to you because we believe the Vandenberg story is so much a part of U.S. foreign policy and because your stature and cooperation have made the bipartisan foreign policy a living, working thing. Now, Murrow turned up the flattery, and that was always a pretty good tactic in dealing with Arthur Vandenberg. It was, he told the Senate, Senator, your words and spirit that made a nonpartisan program possible. That combination, words and spirit, had been Vandenberg's way of charming the Congress and he'd like to think of saving the West. And now Murrow assured him that the network would make no demands on the ailing man's time or energy. To approach the matter on any other basis, Murrow said, would be less than patriotic. Vandenberg liked the proposal, but he had to be frank. I am still far from well, he replied. He had cancer. Much of his left lung was gone. Although he nursed Washington after the holidays, he confided, just between us, I do not know what I can do if I return in January, as is my fondest aspiration. By late 1950, Arthur Vandenberg had become increasingly isolated from everything but the pain, which seldom left him alone. He could no longer dress for visitors as he had in his first months at home. Then, when someone flew out from Washington, John Foster Dulles or a Senate colleague or an old newspaper friend, he would rise from his bed to the wonder of his nurse and appear suddenly at the bottom of the stairs. There he stood, pale and drawn, dressed to receive a visitor with the frail dignity of an old knight strapping on his armor one more time. Now the senator was asking his doctor, who was also his best friend, A.B. Smith, for those of you who may remember that name, the closest question he could pose to the one he feared most. He said he had to know, not as he put it, how much longer I have to live, but what service I shall be able to render in the two years left of his Senate term. He had not yet come to terms with dying. He'd grown accustomed to his role in saving the world, or at least, again, as he saw it, the American way of life. To dwell on the past was to admit the inevitable. Instead, when visitors arrived, he wanted to know what was going on where the action was. Truman and Atchison had their hands full with a war in Korea. As Joe McCarthy from Wisconsin was an embarrassment or worse to Senate Republicans. and He couldn't figure out why Bob Taft was giving him so much rope. Truman controlled Congress now. He didn't need Van Vandenberg in the same way any longer. He didn't depend on him as much, but he still sent him a letter. He said, you just don't realize, and this is uh, Truman wrote in 1950, what a vacuum there's been in the Senate and in the operation of our foreign policy since you left. That has always been one of the difficulties in the continuation of policy in our government. Well, there was that one brilliant moment, those five years at the end of the Second World War, when partisanship seemed to yield to compromise and to consensus. And Vandenberg's career, and we'll talk about this more in a few minutes, embodied two 
quarrels that really are, I think, at the heart of our republic. One between about America's role in the world, between greater global participation and leadership, and the other between and the imperatives of governing. It was his achievement to resolve those quarrels, at least temporarily, to the lasting credit of the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hank. Uh, does anybody want to put any questions? To, to, Hank, would you like to take any questions? Oh, Bill Brands has a question. <laughs> His cheap answer would have been Pearl Harbor, but I think that's, that's not the answer. It, it was a gradual thing. It was the, a combination. In 1943, the, the Republicans took a shellacking in 1940. Their foreign policy, they, the Republican Party was split down the middle between the isolationists and the Wilkie wing. And so with 1944 ahead, they knew they had to agree on a platform. He, charged by the um, chairman of the RNC with heading up the committee, they had a conference on Mackinac Island at the Grand Hotel on, on, over Labor Day weekend in 1943, and he was charged with building a Republican Party consensus for the platform for the, for the following year. And what he did was... Wilkie's allies, uh, a lot of time, and then the congressional wing, Taft and his followers, to agree to be open to a post-war organization, to be open to the idea of a UN. And he made that, they, they, and that pushed him further than he was willing to go, but that was the consensus statement that came out of the Mackinac Conference. And it came out at a time when Roosevelt had suppressed within the Democratic Party all discussion of post-war plans because he didn't want to get into the questions of, of the disposition of Britain's colonies and Russia's role in, in the relationship with Russia. And so that was the first expression by either party or any serious significant group of America's post-war intentions. And that became, that emboldened the Connolly resolution. Later, Con John, uh, um, Tom Connolly of Texas was, was chairing the Foreign Relations Committee at that time. But Vandenberg got a lot of great press for that. He, I think, in, in, he was pulled along as his party spoke in favor of a, of a more visible international role. And then um, soon thereafter, there was the Committee of Eight, the State Department began working with eight senators, including Vandenberg, briefing them on what was happening in the final stages of the war. And for the first time, he was no longer on the outside looking in. He was included in the discussion. And so I would see uh, his work on the platform and his gradual exposure to the challenges at the war's end as being his education uh, that brought him along. 